Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Is this good? All right, great. So uh, first, thanks to Michael and everyone at Junior FSG for letting me talk today. To be completely honest, uh, I'm a little bit nervous about giving this talk because on Meetup it says that tonight is a night of technical talks and code. Unfortunately, tonight, there's not, for my talk at least, there's not going to be any code. But I did spend a lot of time going through all this information and making sure that it's relevant to who we are as a group and that we are the right people to be thinking about this topic. So thanks for indulging me for the next couple of minutes as I talk about this. I'm going to be talking about technology ethics and the health of the internet. But first, who am I? Uh, let me just start with a quick introduction. My name's Keith. Currently, I'm a consultant with Mountain Consulting Group. Um, I graduated with a degree in comms and new media at NUS about a couple of years ago, after uh, where I did UX design. Uh, I did UX design for a couple of startups. After graduating, I went to General Assembly's WDI course and learned how to code and became a full-time full developer from there. Uh, and I became, as I said, a development consultant at Morton Consulting Group. Quick plug, we are hiring aggressively. So if any of you guys are thinking, you know, where can I go? Think about that. Uh, so the reason I'm talking about my background is because it really informs why I am talking about this topic. Because I come from a humanities and design background. I think that people's relationship with technology is this cycle of causes and effects, design decisions dovetailing into human responses. And this relationship is super interesting to me. And it's not just interesting because it has real consequences for people as well. So this is a picture of a woman named Bobby Duncan. Uh, Bobby was accidentally altered by Facebook when she was in college, when she was added to a Facebook group for queer people. The notification that she was added to this group showed up on a news feed, and her conservative parents saw that. The Facebook actually made the decision that group privacy settings would override personal privacy settings. There's no way to really know, you know how they made the decision. And uh, even though she, was, she made that conscious choice to, you know, she was quite uh, strict with her privacy, like she couldn't have seen this coming. So she was disowned by her parents and later attempted suicide. This is all due to the hierarchy of privacy settings. And it's not difficult to imagine this happening to someone that you know yourself. I'm not trying to be intentionally bleak, I'm just saying things have effects. The trend here is actually that the more tech savvy you are, the more optimistic you are about the future. I agree, technology is great. And I'm sure most of you agree with me as well. But the problem here that is the internet is a bit of an unprecedented phenomenon. And as active participants of the internet, I think it's worth practicing a little bit of standing back and looking at the bigger picture once in a while. If you're talking about internet, the, the internet as a medium, you can see here that the rate of penetration growth is way faster than any technology ever before. The content is also richer and more complex. It's because of this that the loop I'm talking about, causes and effects, are just faster and faster and faster. We don't have as much time as before to get things right. So the more time we spend time figuring things out, the more mistakes we make that impact more people. Which brings us to the topic of ethics in technology, the application of ethical thinking to the practical concerns of technology. I am not an ethics student, not a philosophy student, so I don't think there's much point going into the academic side of ethics and philosophy. I am going to talk something about something a little bit more practical and a little bit more relevant to us as a group. Earlier this year, Mozilla released something called the Internet Health Report. It's a story about how the internet is or isn't healthy from a human perspective. And I think we can use it as a metric or a framework to evaluate the impact of the work that we do. There are five main questions that this health report asks to assess the health of the internet. Is it safe? How open is it? Who's welcome? Who can succeed and who controls it? So I'm going to go through into each of these questions and what they mean, and, how, and I'm going to try and link them back to the work that we do. So firstly, is the internet safe? Yeah. We can all think of a lot of ways that it's not. The messy part here is that there's a lot of stuff that's technically legal, but also could be considered unsafe. Most of us live with a lot of perfectly legal things on the internet that, you know, like trackers, cookies, ads. The data that we do surrender allows others to create images of ourselves. It invades our privacy which are little dangers and trade-offs that we make. It's just part and parcel of our world now. It's up to us as developers to really determine the terms and what we do with the data that our users trust us with when they use our products. On the more malicious side of things, our user data is always in danger of being hacked, leaked, used for malicious and nefarious ends. This is where our responsibility comes in as well, making sure that the data we are tasked with is well protected and stored safely and responsibly. 
So things like making sure your passwords are properly encrypted. So I was actually really shocked to find that up to sometime last year, Twitter actually had a bug that stored plain text passwords. So, you know, it happens. Another thing that we can do to keep the internet safe is to un help users understand the terms and conditions that they are giving us their data. Push for a well-written well and understandable privacy policy that is free of jargon and help users understand what it is that they're giving up and what they're getting in return. Don't ask for data simply because you can have it. Ask for what you need, no more. And of course, you know, you don't skimp on the standard security practices uh, when protecting users' data. Next up, how open is the internet? There's a lot of ways you can interpret this question. Big picture says, maybe. Depends on where you are. If you look at this map, it's very good for giving you a bit of perspective because you can see that more than half of the world, the internet is restricted. One third of the world is not assessed. We are actually in the minority here. We're lucky, not everyone is. And you know, most people have, that means most people actually have limited choices in what websites, what applications they're allowed to use. There's not much we can do about this, unfortunately, but you know, we can ask ourselves, how do we make the most of the openness that we do have? So as developers, obviously, we think about open source, right? When you think open. Who participated in Hectoverfest? Good show of hands. Really? OK, never mind. Uh, so we can understand here that open source requires a little bit more than just PRs and code. Negative interactions, according to this GitHub survey, um, at least okay, at least half of contributors have at least witnessed a negative interaction on open source, which makes open source projects less sustainable since they are less encouraged to participate. Maintainers also feel a lot of pressure to you know maintain projects that are used by huge communities for free. So that's a lot of ask of people. What can we do about this? Well, there's resources out there. Uh, there's this one guy that I like quite a lot. It's very simple, easy to remember. There's a lot of resources about there about how to be a good maintainer, how to make sure you have the effective code of conduct, so on. So if you're a developer, you either benefit from open source, contribute to open source, you may even maintain open source. So it's important to understand the standards that help make sure that open source software is something that's well sustained and supported. Next up, who's working on the internet? Unfortunately, to answer this, we have to think about what makes people unwelcome on the internet and what drives them away. Obviously, a lot of this is about cyberbullying, online harassment. Some interesting statistics here that I found. Across the board, actually, less women are online than men. You can see the difference. But a study in Australia actually discovered that men are actually more likely to ab experience abuse online. Uh, what was it? The reporting is under 30 for men was 78%, for women was 76%. Both kind of high numbers. Not, not, not very optimistic. Uh, I'm sure many of us have seen the level of vitriol, level of rudeness that the internet can conjure. And frankly, it's quite disturbing. There are very smart people who are out there trying to fix this problem with smart solutions, but sometimes they do backfire. Um, Instagram slash Facebook's deep text algorithm, uh, their, natural, their natural language processing algorithm, flag the word Mexican as sensitive because it's commonly associated with the word illegal. So. Bunch of problems there. Uh, and how far before lines start greying if you, you know, delegate this to a program when we end up with issues of speech suppression and censorship? It's all black boxes, right? So these are big problems. The sheer, the, the sheer scale of them is pretty daunting. But what we can do on an individual level is accessibility, of course. Things like language. So you can see here that about half the internet is in English which overrepresents the number of native English speakers on the internet. On the side here, you see Chinese, which with the same basic amount of people is pretty underrepresented at around 2%. So internalization is important. The internet is a global phenomenon. You should reflect that. On the other side of things, other than language, there's you know, your basic other accessibility. A great way to think about accessibility that I found is to think of ourselves as all temporarily able until the day that we're not. So I turned Grayscale on my phone as a way of combating phone addiction. And as a result of that, I actually found quite a few things that you know, hindered my usage of my phone. For example, who, who here can tell which of these icons are on and which icons are off? This is a native Apple OS, uh, native UI, Apple UI, by the way. Like, I kind of did expect a bit more from Apple, but 
well, uh, we can see here Spotify as well. They fixed that, by the way. So now there's like a small dot when you have it selected. Very thankful for that. And um, you can see you here also, I don't know who's bootlicking me anymore. It's fine, I'm not too bothered by that. Who can succeed on the internet? Other than us, of course. So, hmm. uh, you can see here obviously that basic digital literacy, literacy skills are becoming more and more important as we get more and more of our news online and on social. And at the same time, only a quarter of people really believe that what you see on the internet doesn't separate fact from, it, sorry, doesn't represent reality well. And for good reasons. So a study here found that the price to instigate a street pro protest was $200,000. For the low price of $200,000, you too can instigate a street protest. And it was also, it also found that um, it took $55,000 to discredit a journalist. I mean, clearly, like, there's a ton of factors in this study, but the fact that they could come to a finding like that is already kind of disturbing. For the amount of change that you could, in, that, that you could capitalize on for a street protest, $200,000, not too high a price tag. So solution, basic digital literacy, of course. But what are the skills required to be a discerning citizen on the internet? It takes a shockingly high number of interlocking skills and knowledge to be able to nav navigate the internet safely and smartly. And, you know, it's a lot of stuff. All of us have our blind spots. So it's important to not assume that everyone knows everything. Yeah. Last question, who controls the internet? So to me, this question is the most, one of the most tiring because it just makes you feel really powerless. On the infrastructure side, of course, we have ISPs, cloud computing hosting providers, and of course, the Fearsome Five. Um, interesting anecdote, earlier this year, cloud, uh, Cloudflare actually essentially shut down an alt-right website, and it was additionally late with their CEO, just one person. He was later quoted as saying, you know, he just woke up one day in a bad way and decided someone didn't deserve to be on the internet. And they didn't deserve to be on the internet, but that's kind of frightening power with one person. Yeah, most of the internet can be attributed to these five, you know, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft. Personally, um, I've been trying to quit Google products over the past few years. I've mostly managed it. It's really, really difficult. And I deleted the apps, but I still haven't found the strength in me to delete my Facebook and Instagram accounts. I'm sure the data here isn't surprising to most of us. So this is, this Pac-Man here is Google's uh, control over the browser market, and this is their control over search. Both are really key elements of using the internet, of course. Most other industries will look at this chart of market share and alarm bells will start ringing. How this affects us as developers, so I don't expect you to read this, but earlier this year, um, it came out that React's license actually included a clause that if you use React to build an application that is a direct competitor to any of their products, the license is potentially revoked. There was a lot of uh, uproar about that, and they eventually changed it, but it was there. <laughs> so it's always good to understand like, the tools they're using and where they're coming from. Um, for example, uh, from a few years ago, Flickr, still around. Uh, if you decide to use Flickr for image uh, hosting, it's passed through Yahoo, both Verizon and it's now owned by a company named SmugMug, which I honestly did not hear before I researched this talk. So Flickr's user data, their photos have passed through all of these companies. And that's not something you could have anticipated when you just decided to use it back when they were, you know, their own thing, sort of. So it's, it's hard to anticipate, but it's always important to know like the tools they're using, where they come from, where they might go, as <coughs> difficult as that might be. So that was a blazing fast run through of the five questions of how healthy the internet is. We can use these as a framework for when we want to push something out into a world, how it affects the internet. Are we making it safer, more accessible, more welcome, more open? I'm not asking you to be paralyzed by these questions. I know it's easy to be, but it's also important to have them in the back of your mind when you make decisions because the nature of the internet is that we're all participants, whether we consume or create. What can we do? That's the million dollar question. And very honestly, I 
don't know. <laughs> it's a lot here to process, and it's easy to say that you know it's the responsibility of the designer or the product manager or the business guy or even the user themselves. Sure, you know, it's easy to brush off the questions when you're just making hello world toy apps, learning a new language. As it should be. Like, you shouldn't need to ask these questions when you're just trying to do these small things. That's one of the most frustrating things I experienced when preparing this talk, because honestly, it's just a whole bunch of really big problems with no clear solutions. But I guess, you know, sometimes it's all that we can do to just be aware of, uh, of these issues and to just have a clear understanding that we can get of the bigger picture while we work. I mean, I've run through a couple things that we actually can do as developers. Pushing for access accessibility is something that everyone can do. Participating in open source, we can be better participants. You know, It's not just about writing code, it's about being a supportive part of community. It's about being a more empathic person. And I'm assuming, oh, sorry. I'm assuming this is a, you know, this is a junior dev meetup, but I'm assuming most of us don't want to be junior for long. So eventually we're going to be making decisions with real impact. And I'm hoping that when the time comes for us to make real decisions with, con with real consequences, these questions can help make us make decisions that end up with a better internet for all. As you can see, I went through a ton of articles, examples, data as part of my research. Uh, a lot of it is available on the original report. So internethealthreport.org slash 2018 for this year's one. Uh, there's a couple more easy links. I reference this open source guide. Uh, for those who are more interested in the design side of things, it's an extremely comprehensive uh, report of the state of design in the tech industry here. And in terms of staying up to date with news, uh, with editorials, I personally love Wired. And for a bit more on the business side as well, Recode is also very good. Uh, yeah, thanks for your time and for your attention. Uh, I truly appreciate it. I hope I haven't taken up too much time. Like, there was a lot to go through. Uh, if anyone has anything they'd like to ask or correct me with, or just discuss, uh, my contact information is there. I'm there on Twitter. And my email is there. Uh, I'll be around. You can just say hi. So uh, yeah, thanks, everyone, for your time, for listening.